Europe was in the hands of dictators. The thing to do is get an interview with the dictator, see? Well, I was Berlin correspondent of the Chicago Tribune, and yet, despite the fact I've been, I, I mean, I went to, to Italy and saw Mussolini, I went to, I even saw Lenin, but here I am, 10 years in Germany, and I can't say I even met Hitler. And Pierre, that is, looks at me and says, you're crazy. We spent a whole night with Hitler, a whole evening with Hitler. And a contract was drawn up by which the Hearst News Service was sold to the German papers for $400,000 a year. Within a month or two after this contract was made, you will find, and I have photo stats of it, uh, Goering and uh, Goebbels and people like that having full pages favoring Nazism appearing in the Hearst Sunday Supplement magazines. We can't talk of the Spanish Civil War. There was no civil war in Spain. There was an officer's uprising. I got there as soon as possible in 36. The second in our series about America's premier and suppressed press muckraker. George Seldes, tonight on Alternative Views. George Seldes is a man who's lived in the shadows of American journalism, a giant living in the shadows of American journalism. Why haven't you heard of him? Well, for most of his journalistic career, he's been, you might call it, a marked man. Boycotted, blacklisted by the American press establishment. Why? Well, he went after the press itself. He was the press's critic. George, you've uh, covered the noted and the notorious. Let's, let's, let me tick off a few names for you. Uh, you met Lenin. How with the Tribute, Chicago Tribune, you uh, also went to Italy and, and covered Mussolini and the rise of fascism there. Another fascist was uh, Adolf Hitler. You met him. Tell us uh, some of his... Uh, tell us, give us your impressions of Adolf Hitler. To all the dictators, I mean, I think, I mean, I, uh, I never knew Franco. That was after time. But as a Chicago Tribune man, uh, Europe was in the hands of dictators. The thing to do is get an interview with the dictator, see? Well, I was Berlin correspondent of the Chicago Tribune, technically. Well, I was, I was officially there for, say, five years. And then I was made roving correspondent for Eastern Europe with headquarters in Berlin for five more years. In other words, for 10 years, I was headquarters in Berlin. I had a beautiful suite of rooms, Hotel Adlon, and all that. And uh, I quit in 1929 when my order for my first book was, and I had a book published and all that. And some years, even after I'd quit, we were, I was sitting with a lot of newspaper people reminiscing about, we were all had seen service in Berlin, and there was a man named Pierre Loving of the Hearst Service. He was then Washington, in the Washington Bureau of the Hearst Service. And I said, isn't it strange, Pierre? I've seen Hitler a dozen times. I heard, I've been to Nuremberg, to the great festival, you know, that this, uh, what's her name, this? Lady Yes, that she, Reasons. And Lenny and Reasons. Yes, that she uh, choreographed. It was terrific. It was tremendous. It was, he was wonderful, you might say, as, as a demagogue and those things. I said, and yet, 
despite the fact I mean I, I, mean, I went to, to Italy and saw Mussolini I went to I even saw Lenin but here I am 10 years in Germany and I can't say I even met Hitler and Pierre that is looks at me and says you're crazy we spent a whole night with Hitler a whole evening with Hitler and I said oh, I don't remember anything he said well he said do you remember when the Baron von, uh, well, whatever his name was, the U.S. and the German ambassador to the United States, Baron von something, gave a party in the Wilhelmstrasse, in the Foreign Office, for the leaders of the different parties, you know, communists, socialists, uh, monarchists, uh, all of them were there, various leaders. Um, and the journalists of all countries were a couple of hundred people there. There were about a hundred members of the uh, uh, the Foreign Press Club, the Verein Ausländische Journalisten zu Berlin. We were all there. He says, don't you remember that everybody was nice and cordial and you talked to the different party leaders, but there was one sullen man sitting sort of all by himself. The man with the tiny must. Oh, my, I said. All he says, good talk. Good talk. When we came in, then we held out our hand and he sort of gave you a limp little hand and said, good talk, and you went away. And that is all the man did and no, I mean, I say, he was so unnoticed that I was taking, I would say to my great regret, although seeing him in action when he became this great leader and fascinated or whatever he did to millions of people, you know, and yet when he was this nobody, that's exactly what he was in 19, uh, when was this, about 25, and 23, he had led the beer hall revolution and uh, uh, I have a I even have a poster or at least somewhere I don't know uh, um, you know in which it said uh, nationalists anti-semites this is what it says uh, four nine uh, meeting in nine nine uh, Brauhaus you know the each brewery had uh, you might say a cafe where they dispensed their own beer. It was a beer hall, but you know, holding a thousand, two thousand people, you don't know what Munich beer halls are like. They're tremendous. It's the whole, the whole nightlife was, I mean, the, the, centered around them, and everybody went. Well, he, he, and about I forget now what he had, three hundred members or something. They, they decided to to start the uh, the uh, Nazi revolution there, the, the, uh, what they call the Nationalist Socialist Workers Party. They call it a National Socialist, by the way. That's what Nazi means. And it's Nazism, not Nazism. I hate that word. Nazi means National Workers, National Social Workers Party. Ism has ended on. Well, you can't cut off one of the things. You say, well, anyway, so he walked in with his people, jumped on a table, fired bullets into the ceiling, and says the revolution has begun. They all started to laugh. And, no, if the Germans had a greater sense of humor, there'd have been no Hitler. But so afterwards, he went out into the street, and he and Ludendorff and his 300 or 3,000 followers started marching on the city hall to, to start the revolution. And the city of Munich sent out what they called the Grüne, the Green. Now, the police force wore green uniforms, so they were known as the Greens. Sent out the Green police force. The police force came, saw them advancing with, there was uh, Hitler Mussolini, uh, Hit, Hitler uh, Ludendorff leading, see, then the followers, they took their rifles, pointed them in the air, and fired a volley into the air. Immediately, Hitler fell on the ground, or, or Ludendorff fell on the ground, dragging Hitler with him. Anyway, Hitler dragged himself around the corner of a building so that they couldn't shoot him. See, he thought they were going to shoot. Uh, Ludendorff got up and with his hands raised, sought to surrender. The commander-in-chief of, of the German armies during the First World War sought to surrender to a policeman. Can you believe it? Well, that's what happened. Well. Uh, Hitler and Hess and uh, they, they, there was a trial you know and they were found guilty of attempting a revolt treason or something and they were sentenced to a couple of years in prison something like that and uh, there is where I think Hess 
wrote Mein Kampf and not Hitler. It is said that Hitler dictated the book and Hess wrote it. Actually, it's some brilliant lines in it, some intelligent stuff from the, their viewpoint of, of uh, manipulating human brain, brainwashing, mani manipulate, manipulating human beings is in that book. And I think it's Hess's idea. Hess was a brilliant man. Well, they spent, see, this was the end of 23, this happened, so 24, and then he came out and he was sullen and morose and talked to nobody and was, got nowhere and hadn't started the movement yet. I think it took quite a number of years before it got started. How long did you stay in Germany? I stayed there till the January the 1st, 1929. So you actually, though, were there to see the rise of Nazism. Were you there yeah. uh, at the time of the... Of the subsidy and promotion of, of fascism by the German... Well, that people. was a secret. How do, who knows? You see, look, I lived in the Hotel Adlon. The richest man in Germany, one of the richest men in the world, also had a suite of rooms in that hotel. His name was Hugo Stinnes. I mean, Getty. Uh, this fellow Bunker who tried to corner... I mean, he was of that type. He was worth billions of dollars. Now, I wrote this for the Chicago Tribune on one of my trips home, but this is the kind of, of story that ought to, everyone on the world ought to know it. Who destroyed the German Republic? My, when I say that this man, Stinnis, the richest man, the, he, I think he had 600,000 workers in a steel and coal plants. He also, had an interest or owned 63 newspapers. He had a part interest in some of the four big banks. They were known as the D banks. You know, the Dresdener Bank, the something. There were four big banks. They were known as the D banks. He had an interest in that. He, uh, how did he destroy Germany? I, I, I wrote this. And the Tribune published it. Nobody knows it except in Chicago, a few people perhaps. Uh, he paid his workmen once every two weeks. He sold everything. He stopped selling his stuff for Marx in Germany. He sold his coal, his iron, his product. Oh, he was one of the originators of what you might call a vertical trust. A vertical trust is not to get everything in your line but one of each if it helps you. For instance, if you've got coal, why not own a railroad? Why not have a smelter? Why not have this, that, or the other? Why not have an electric plant? You see, one of each, you see, since he had coal and steel and everything, he owned railroads. Then, of course, he owned newspapers for publicity and just for his name. Very well. He took his coal and iron and everything he manufactured and sold them abroad. England for pounds, France for francs, uh, Holland, you see. And most of the money, almost all of it was good money. I mean, hard money, what they called in Europe in those days. I don't think there was any inflated money. There may be a little inflation. France may have gone instead of five to 10 francs or maybe even 20 to the dollar, but not millions, billions. Of in Germany, the price could change, say, from 100,000 marks to the dollar in the morning to 200,000 marks to the dollar in the evening. I mean, the bank rate could have changed to that. I have a list somewhere of how it went from four, from four million to four quintillion in the year 1923. Well, he kept all his money in pounds and shillings and Marx and Kroner and whatever it was, pesos, pesetas, abroad. And when it came to paying his workmen, he would draw a check for, a, say, a, a thousand pounds instead of 20,000 pounds or 100,000 pounds. Get the number of marks, trillions of marks, and pay his workmen and Marx. And the workmen would have to, as they say, take a, a baby carriage load of Marx to buy a loaf of bread. Now that is, he ruined his own country because when Hitler came into power, it was on the slogan, we, we didn't lose the war, we were stabbed in the back. The, uh, the profiteers and the so forth, 
and the people who ruined the, the inflation people, the international bankers, the Jews, the communists, the socialists stabbed us in the back. I mean, that was the big propaganda, you see. And uh, it worked. And no one has ever told the truth about people. Thiessen did. Thiessen wrote a book called I Paid Hitler. The only man ever told the truth of the crowd. Now, Thiessen was as almost, a, Thiessen and the Krups, these are the kind of people I'm talking about. Stinnes is the unknown man who was on the same rank, if not higher, than Thiessen and Krupp in those days. He was the big newcomer in, in industry. I mean, those things do happen. You don't have to be of a, you know, the old, uh, uh, the, the old Vanderbilts or something like that. He was a newcomer, but he, he got it all. He was the richest man, as I say, in Germany. There was a certain period there when after several years in which Nazism, see, the party, the Nazi party, was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, there was a general election in which they didn't collapse, but they suddenly fell, and the socialists took a, a big leap forward. I don't know which part. 1932. Yes. The Reichstag that, elections. Yes, that's what it was it. Now, I think this is the time when Thiessen and the rest must have had their meetings, which I, I think it's the Brown Book of Nazism. There's a book which tells about these meetings of who the bankers were, you know, the Schroeder banks and, the, uh, and Thiessen and all the rest. Now, Stennis also secretly was a big uh, supplier of money for the Hitlerites. So you see, you see National Socialism, not uh, the Nazi movement, as a reaction to militants and the part of the working class and the success in the electoral elections by well, the socialists? Well, to, as at least an explanation in part. I mean, uh, I mean uh, obviously, I mean, look, after all, uh, uh, Ebert had taken a country that had been defeated. Imagine, they defeated in the First World War, but it was, it, it was a tragic defeat. Do you know that the French took every good railroad train and locomotive away and things like that? I mean, Germany was stripped bare. And in, in, in a few years from under Ebert, you know, when, when I met Hindenburg, in which he, I said, what are you doing now? He says, he says, I'm a military, I take orders. My orders now come from the president, Ebert. I shall disband the army in according with his rules and retire to private life. I am now in the employ of President Ebert. That's what he said. And he meant it, I believe, maybe at that time, not afterwards. Well, power went to his head, too, maybe. You maybe see? this is a good point to sort of make the lead. You, um, yeah. you wrote a book, you can't print that, where you talk about suppression and censorship yes. in foreign yes. countries. Yes. And yes. especially I the role of the press in failing to uncover and reveal the links between uh, William Randolph Hearst and Hitler, the That's role of the Reader's points. Digest yes. and the rest. Could, yes. you, might, you might be able to elaborate on those yes. points. I never met Hearst, by the way, but his chief lieutenant in Europe was uh, von Wiegand, Karl von Wiegand. We used to play poker, thank God for von Wiegand. When we were getting I was getting $50 a week salary. I never got more than 60 from the colonel. Everybody else was getting 100 to 125. That was good foreign pay in those days. Because the colonel figured out they all want to live in Europe, have a good time, living is cheap, give them European wages. The people on the Paris edition itself got 25 a week. People like Shirer and Sheehan, Vincent Sheehan and others, you see, some of them who became noted writers afterwards. Jolas, who started Transition, these were all... Oh, Henry Miller, who, you know, Tropic of, he was a proofreader for the Tribute, 25 a week they all got. Well, anyway, Carl von Wiegand got $375 a week from Colonel, from Hearst. He got 100 from the Cosmopolitan, 100 from the INS, 100 from the um, um, Hearst Service, 100 from the Knickerbocker Press, I don't know, the f different Hearst organizations. I know he was 375 for this reason. We would play poker. He was the worst poker player I ever met because he had to be in every pot. So at the end, he would take out one of his checks, you see. So I kept noticing. 
He would say, I owe, uh, I owe $75 tonight. So divide this among you and take out a $75 check. Or take out a $100 check. Does anybody got $25? You divide this among you, see? So Hearst Magazine. Oh, Hearst Internet. Hearst, the Hearst Magazine was called the Hearst International, I think, at that time. Big magazine. Bigger than Cosmopolitan one time. Well, anyway, so he, he, he got that. Well, in 1934, and this is the story that Ambassador Dodd, took, well, I met Ambassador Dodd, I was a friend of his son and daughter, William Dodd, Jr., and his daughter, Martha. I still write to Martha. She's living in Czechoslovakia. Well, anyway, uh, the idea was this. Hearst a, a meeting was arranged by von Wigan at uh, one of the spas, like, uh, oh, wherever, the, not Karlsbad, that's in Czechoslovakia. You know, the Bad, Karlsbad, no, Karlsbad is Czechoslovakia. One of the spas, you see. Uh, Hearst was there, Hamstangl was there, you know, Putzi Hamstangl, who was the sort of press chief for Hitler. And a contract was drawn up by which the Hearst News Service was sold to the German papers for $400,000 a year. Now, this is now in the libel suit afterwards with a magazine called Friday, owned by a man named Gilmore. The charge is made that at no, at no country in the world has Hearst ever gotten more than 75,000, that's one, but most of them are 40 and 50,000 a year for his complete news service. That the other $360,000 was a bribe. Well, that is merely what a lawyer says. But what you can find in pictures of this book is that within a month or two, after this contract was made, you will find, and I have photo stats of it, uh, Goering and uh, Goebbels and people like that having full pages favoring Nazism appearing in the Hearst Sunday Supplement magazines. You see, that's what I mean. If it wasn't a bribe, what was it? Because, and then, of course, here they are. There are the pictures for you. And, and then... Mr. Hearst wrote an editorial, signed it with his own name, in which he says that Hitler has revived the great spirit of the old German people and they'll be a great nation again and all like that, in favor of Hitler. I mean, I don't say that he went on and, and said the thing to do now is to massacre the Jews or invade Poland and, and, and you see. Hearst wasn't alone in this. The Reader's Digest also wrote yeah. some very flattering the, things the, about... And, and, well, the Reader's Digest, I simply, just reading the Reader's Digest, I came across uh, articles saying what's good in, uh, in Hitler Germany and things like that, which is pure, you might say, propaganda. And in those days, there's no question that the, the, the Reader's Digest is something I, I don't know anyone else except my newsletter, in fact, ever pointed out in issue after issue. The Reader's Digest in its under, underhand crooked ways was one of the leading anti-labor or publications in America. It had two or three well-known anti-labor writers and they wrote articles against unionism and labor unions and all like that. This, there is no question of that. And, and, and Well, I mean, as far as Hitler goes, here is the proof. Here is an issue of Reader's Digest. It says May 1938. And what is there, uh, what have they got in the May 1938? Hey. A feature story by Stephen Roberts, the house that Hitler built. All in favor of Hitler. Now, that's one of them. Now here is an article by Douglas Reed. It says, what's good in Germany? This is dated September 1938, the same issue. No, this is May 38, September 38. Now, or later on in 39, on Franco's side in Spain. On Franco's side in Spain, a, a, uh, an article favoring, uh, oh, I didn't notice this. It says condensed from the New York Times. 
Anyway, it's by Ellery Sedgwick, who was the editor of the Atlantic, and who was as close a, as to fascist or Nazi as any American I know. So the bulk of the American press was pro-fascist and anti-labor? The bulk anti of the American press accepted the, the fascist statement that the other side was red. Do you ever have, did you ever attend a rally in Nuremberg? Yes, oh yes. Could you, could, could you just sort of, could you well. just paint some of the picture of what that was like and what kind of, what kind of a, a speaker and what was the sort of atmosphere of, of one of those rallies? It's incredible that the man who crawled in the dust around the corner when they fired a volley into the air in 1923, by 19... 30. Well, I was in Germany last in 31. I went back once or twice, you know, just for a few weeks just to see just what things were, or maybe for a chapter of a book or something. But I don't know when I attended this rally, but I know I was in the press section in the galleries. But there's no question that either the man had it hidden in him, or the, uh, the hysteria of, the, of power drew it out of him. It's hard to believe that this you know, he was a Feldwebel, meaning a corporal. He was a runner in the, you know, in the First World War. It's hard to believe that in so few years that he would stand up, you know, glorified as, I mean, uh, uh, as an enormous figure uh, at, at addressing 100,000 people and the, the Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, and the, 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 the surge of emotion would carried everybody away except the newspaper people, I might say, and uh, it, 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 I don't know, it could have affected him too. I mean, his own, he was made by his own power. George, the next topic I'd like to discuss with you is a, is a very painful one the Spanish Civil War, about which Albert Camus wrote, It was in Spain that men learned that one can be right and yet be beaten, that force can vanquish spirit, that there are times when courage is not its own recompense. It is this, doubtless, which explains why so many men, the world over, regard the Spanish drama as a personal tragedy. Give us your thoughts. Toward the end of 36, the war began on July 19th, I believe, 36. That's, first of all, look, we can't talk of the Spanish Civil War. There was no civil war in Spain. There was an officer's uprising. I think the Spanish refer to these things as a pronunciamento. Where they take place in South American, Latin American countries about, in the old days, they used to take place every Thursday and Wednesday or something like that. They took, I mean, all of it. Well, all that happened here was that, that uh, the Republic had started in 31, and in 34, the, the reactionary elements actually won the election. Whether it was a fair election or not, I'm not going to argue whether there was ballot boxes broken or not. But they, and then Franco, by the way, was an officer of the Republic. Therefore, he committed treason in this rebellion. But before then, in 34, the Asturian miners had a rebellion because of the repressive situation there. And mining conditions, if things are bad in Pittsburgh, you can imagine what they were in the Asturias. Ah, so whom did, whom did the, not the, not the, uh, the lib, not the liberal republic, but the people in charge of the republic, who were uh, Gil Robles and, uh, and these people, who afterwards became the leader of the fascists, they sent a, a regiment or a, a small army uh, under the command of a general whose name was Franco, and who shot down the, 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 the workers, the Asturian miners. That is why Passionaria, you see, who was the wife of an Asturian miner, became the communist leader. This is what made her that. It was the 1934 shooting down of the working people by a, by a man who at that time technically was still the employee of a republic did it. Well, on the Franco side, there were 
Hitler's Condor Legion, about 50,000 people who saw service in the aviation, and 200,000 Italian infantry, I'll have you know, did most of the fighting, and of course the Moors that Franco brought in, you see. Now, who were on the loyalist side? In, in, uh, I got there as soon as possible in 36, but the, they were still doing it. They, they called the working people out of their factories and shops, and they put guns in their hands. And they said, defend the city. People who had never fired a gun, some of them. Even later on, when the American, uh, when the uh, International Brigade was organized, Alva Bessie told me that, that when he came there, or some of the others, in six days they were told how to use a rifle and sent to the front. In six days, mind you, instead of six months of training or something like that. But largely they called on all the unions and the working people and they called on the Asturian miners and they called on the Basque miners and they called on the uh, landless peasants you see to join the Republican a lot of them did but I mean there were no trained troops at all on our side there's only one man had the courage to tell the truth and that was Claude Bowers he was our American ambassador and he said so, and he wrote a book, My Mission to Madrid, in which he says so probably on his first page, it was not a civil war. It was a, it was a general's uprising against the people. And on the other side, there were nothing but the people. Now, among the people, the working people, well, there were all kinds. There were, it's true, a lot of people, a lot of, uh, well, a lot, a lot is made of the fact there were a lot of anarchists. Now the truth is that there were almost no communists, say 15,000, 20,000. There were a larger number of socialists, but a very small fraction of the people. On the other hand, the FAI, which was the Federación Iberica Anarchista, the Anarchist Federation of Workers in Barcelona, practically they were called themselves. I don't know how much anarchist they were or whose followers they were, but they were an organization. That, I know they ran the streetcars of Barcelona even during the war. They were anarchists, you see. Now, as far the anarchists would, did not hesitate to burn the churches. I will say that. But on the other hand, the Republic is accused of burning the churches. And as far as I know, the Republicans didn't burn any church. I don't think the communists even burned churches. Certainly the socialists didn't burn any churches. Well, and those were certainly the common were... working people didn't burn their own churches. Th those were stories that were circulated during the war about atrocities on the atrocities, part of the Republican atrocities, side. Atrocities, atrocities, And the people who thought they were being fair said, well, there were atrocities on both sides. I mean, people who equate, you see, massacres on one side and 20 people taken out and court-martialed or shot on the other. I mean, look, I think that the, the Franco people, at least in the books now published in Spain, historical books, uh, not written by radicals or reds or anything, but the history, it says that in the first 10 years of, this, of Franco's rule, there were several hundred thousand people uh, in, uh, in jail. In fact, he, Everybody who had a blue mark here, and those are mostly working people, didn't know how to handle a rifle, and they'd get kicked back, you see. They were put in jail, and Franco executed at least 10,000 people a year for 10 years after the first 10 years after the war was over. This is not listed as an atrocity. No one ever mentions it or anything. Why? I don't know why. But... The fact that the anarchists destroyed some churches. Bauer said, I looked at them all, and I knew that they were the, these black, sh by the way, black and red were their colors. And they didn't hesitate. I mean, the anarchists would, like, you know, nowadays they say there's certain atrocity that takes place, or terrorism, and so-and-so takes credit for it. Well, in the old days, as a rule, everybody kept quiet about things like that. But... Uh, not the anarchists. The anarchists admitted it. They believed in a certain amount of terrorism, perhaps. Incidentally, the anarchist movement now under the new republic, and that's one of the things Passionaria told me about. It's, uh, in fact, she, 
got rather excited about it when she told me, she says, and the, one of the important things of today is that the anarchist movement has fallen verticalmente. And she sort of got up like this and with her hand, you know, which I thought was a very good gesture. Well, anyway, this, this is, this is it, it was foreign troops, fascists, Nazis, against the working people and their allies, including anarchists, if you want to say so, who were this, that, and the other. I don't know. My father used to be called a philosophical anarchist or something, just because he didn't belong to one of the regular parties. But what, what, and I have a sympathy for Prince Kropotkin, and if Tolstoy and Prince Kropotkin were anarchists, I mean, they were philosophers. Who financed Franco? Last year, I think it was, or six months ago, there was a series of articles in the New Yorker of Juan, of the Duke of Alba and Juan Marsh, mostly about Juan Marsh, the people who financed Franco. Why did they finance Franco? Juan Marsh was one of the biggest bankers. He was he used to be a cigarette smuggler. He used to smuggle British cigarettes from Gibraltar into Spain. And he was in jail once. Then he became a banker. Then he became the biggest banker in Spain. The Duke of Alba was an illegitimate son of King James of England. He is the Duke of Berwick of England. He's a Fitz James. Fitz meaning, yes. Well, he used to say, I can walk from Irun on the French border to Cadiz, U.S. naval base, south on the Mediterranean, without taking my foot, my feet off my own lands. That man owned millions of acres of land. He was a feudal landowner. The working people, the, especially the farm workers, had nothing. They were they were absolutely no better than the serfs were in Russia. And that is the situation that the Republic tried to remedy. It is true that being a liberal Republic and not being a radical Republic, they didn't take radical measures. They went slowly, gradualism. Well, I mean, you know, there are many people with great ideas, great socialists. I mean, the Webbs, I think, Sidney and Beatrice Webb in England, the, the whole Fabian socialist movement of England believed in gradualism, didn't they, more or less? Well, it, didn't, it was too late in Spain. I mean, desperate, remi desperate diseases need des require desperate remedies. And they should have taken the land immediately. They did. That's why the Duke of Alba financed Franco, because they did take a large part of his millions of acres of land. And uh, Juan March was simply the banker who... And this, he was exposed in a series, imagine, this year or last year in the New Yorker, Juan March, the secret of the financing of, of Franco appeared this year, or within a year in the New Yorker. But it did I, not appear in the New York Times at the time of the war, you know. What was, what was the role of the American press during the Spanish The American the press Civil war? covered itself with filth almost, almost all from the first day of the war to the other. It was incredible. They, the, the, red, the red banner was pinned on the Republic, and that ruined the Republic. The, all the nations got together and passed a neutrality pact that no foreigners would be allowed, and all the nations knew what was happening, and nobody took anything. Only two nations did anything at all for the Republic, and that was Mexico, which tried to send chips with food and medicines, which the United States government prohibited. They stopped the Mexicans. So Stalin did send perhaps a total, some people say 500, I mean, uh, Thomas, you Thomas, read the books on the war, maybe 700. They had a few aviators, a few squadrons of aviators, I don't know how many. The seven. 100, 500, or say 700, and it included doctors that they sent. It also included, I might say, a lot of police officers. And I, I mean, the fact that Stalin 
uh, helped them doesn't mean that Stalin eventually didn't betray them and double-crossed them and all that because he's only looking after one thing and that was himself and his regime. And he sold them out, you see, to, to, to save the uh, Hitler from marching against Russia. That was what the 1931 pact was about. He absolutely sold out the uh, Spain. So Spain had no friends. Now, it is true that the day that Bowers came back from Spain, as he walked into FDR's ro uh, office, before he even got to Roosevelt's desk, Roosevelt yelled to him across the big room, Bowers, I think we were on the wrong side. I think I made a mistake. It's in Bowers' book that he admitted it before he even got to discuss the matter with him. But on the other hand, what did Mr. Bowers do? What did FDR do with Bowers? Bowers is a poor man. He sent him as ambassador to different places so he couldn't write his memoirs till 10 or 15 years afterwards. Now, Bowers, if someone would have grabbed him at that time, if there was some kind of an association with a little money and say, look, you deliver a series, here's $25,000. We want you to deliver 25 speeches in 25 cities and stir up the American people when he came back with the news. It might have helped. But nothing like that was done. Take the case of the, the press. I told you the, fact the press was disgraceful. Uh, I happen to know, a, when I came back, I came back at the, I was there 36, 37, came back at the end of 37. I happen to know a Colonel Riley, R-A-I-L-E-Y, H-H, who happened to be the closest friend of Adolf, uh, 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 a. H. Sulzberger, Arthur Hayes Sulzberger, who had married Cox's daughter and was owner or editor, editor or owner or main owner of the Times. And we were talking as, about this, and I was telling him about what was happening in Spain. He said, look, he said, I want you to talk to Sulzberger. So he took me to what? Lotus Club? Would that be the, about one of the biggest clubs in New York City? One of the real swanky places? And one of the best for the, you know? Took me to the Lotus Club to dinner with that is Salzburger. Took, and he listened and listened and listened to me. And he said, well, you know, I, he says, I'm not a journalist. I'm a silk merchant, <laughs> said Mr. Salzburger. He said, I, sh I have given orders. I want both sides covered equally. You see? And then when you took up the paper, you would find the news from Spain with a headline. On one side, there would be a story with the name of Carney, William Carney, with the Franco troops. On the other side, uh, Herbert L. Matthews with the loyal side. Now, let me give you an actual episode of what happened. On one side, uh, uh, Carney wrote a story saying the Arganda Bridge was captured by Franco today. This is the last uh, avenue that the loyalists have, that Madrid has, of uh, getting food, supplies, medicines, and ammunitions, and it's the, uh, meaning it's the end of the war. On the next side, there is this eyewitness account. Mr. Matthews, I went with him, at the risk of his life, because there were shooting in the neighborhood, that's true, we went to the Arganda Bridge, and just to say that the story is not true, we crossed the bridge to the other side. The trucks were coming in from Barcelona. It's true that they were close by. We could hear machine gun fire. That's close. But the avenue was open. You see it all like that. Now, Mr. Ox, Mr. Salzberger, not being an editor, his idea of fairness was to have a story saying the Arganda Bridge, see, and an eyewitness account saying it ain't so, balancing each other, that gives a fair play to both. You can't equate a total falsehood with an eyewitness account of a truthful event, can you? But that's, he, he told the people. Now it is true that, uh, who was it, uh, Talese, who wrote this book, The Power and the... Gay Talese. Huh? Gay Talese. That's Gay right. Talese, yeah. He wrote this book in, in which it's the first time, although we knew it, it, these were known as the fascist failings in the bullpen. There were four assistant or five assistant editors. McCall was one of them. 
uh, two E.L. James. <coughs> and they were, well, I'm not going to bring any religious men. I don't want to have any religious disputes about it. But they were Catholic in the Catholic establishment right. in the United they, States, had look, supported Franco. There was no Franco. question about it. That uh, Franco the, uh, claimed to be running a Christian crusade against godless communism. That is what he was running, the crusade, you see. And that he was, no doubt, backed by the Vatican. The Vatican afterwards, uh, Pius XII, blessed the Italian troops that came back, you know. Well, anyway, this fascist phalanx, he says plainly they, that they were Catholics who slanted the news from their religious viewpoint. Because there were 700 people sent from Russia, they said there was a Russian army there. Now, no one has ever seen one Russian soldier. By soldier, I do not mean an aviator or a mechanic in the aviation unit or a member of the tank corps. I mean an infantryman. There was not one Russian soldier infantryman. There were, if not 200,000, there were troops. I myself saw rounded up in a, in, a, in, a, in a wire enclosure, although there was no reason for keeping him prisoner. They loved us. 1,200 Italians who came over to our side when the first four divisions ran away at the battle called the Battle of of Guadalajara. That's another misnomer. It was the Battle of Brihuega, which was 10 or 15 miles. They tried to get to Guadalajara. They never got there. I was in Guadalajara waiting for them. They never got there. At Brihuega, they were stopped. They were stopped by whom? By the Italian working people of Madrid under a man named Carlos, General Carlos, his real name was, was Vittorio Vidali. He was a Trieste boy. He went and organized all the Italian working men in Madrid the day that Franco started the rebellion. And when he heard that there were Italian troops there, he went out with a megaphone. And there were four divisions at trying to get to Guadalajara and surround Madrid. And he had Fratelli Italiani, we are your brothers. What are you fighting for? You see, we're fighting for the welfare of all the people and all this. And you are fighting for Mussolini, who said you were being sent to Ethiopia on police duty. Well, it opened their eyes. They didn't even know they were in Spain, some of the first ones who landed there. They were getting 40 liras a day more, though. He did pay them more when he sent them abroad. So you say the press was... Even and the press... Look, I mean, in that situation, when the Italian troops ran away and we interviewed 1,200, we arrived, we talked to the Italians who said we're glad that the, it's over for us. We come back, what, 50 miles perhaps, or whatever it was, to Madrid, and there is the censor with a telegram addressed to Matthews of the time saying, why do you say there are Italian troops in Spain? Carney says there aren't any. Carney on the other side where it had the Italian troops sent a telegram that there were no Italian troops there and Matthews who with me were interviewing the Italian prisoners who had seen these, these 40,000 run away when, when Vidali talked to Italian to them get a telegram like this signed E.L. James and I expose things like this and the Times gives an order never to mention my name or review my books because I tell the facts about how dirty and crooked they were in the, in the Spanish War. It was James's fault. As I say, Mr. Salzberger didn't even know what was happening. I mean, if anybody I ever hated in the newspaper business, I think I hated James a whole lot more than I would hate an out-and-out -out known crook like, uh, say, uh, William Randolph Hearst, who made a deal with Hitler for $400,000 for his news service. This concludes the second of the three-part series on that magnificent man, George Zeldis. We have with us Dr. Gene Bird, professor of journalism at the University of Texas, who knows George Zeldis and has had a big part in reviving the name of George Zeldis in journalistic circles and also uh, for the general public. 
Uh, Gene, what is your evaluation of George Seldes and his contribution to journalism and to history? Well, this man who's, who's just come into your living rooms and dens is a voice of both the past and the present. Uh, he's not only a man who is uniquely uh, humble and I think courageous in his criticism of the press historically, and a critic of historians also, but he's a, a great and grand man who practices and, and continue to, to practice journalism. You note he is very unpretentious and he is refreshing in contrast to many of the yeah. pompous uh, eyewitness uh, anchor people we see on television. Uh, he's in contrast also to the frequently conceited and rather arrogant uh, reporters and self-centered professors and uh, a few doctoral students. Uh, we see who blindly accept the uh, New York Times as the word of God. Uh, <laughs> and perhaps you'd agree how much uh, more realistic uh, are his observations than you recall the old Walter Cronkite uh, TV series titled You Are There uh, and the over-dramatized uh, docudramas that we see uh, in which television makes uh, yesterday's news seem like ancient history. Sells is, is unique, as I think you would agree, after having seen in this series, because he's one of those few journalists who thinks about what he does. Uh, and that is an observation of, uh, of uh, Everett Dennis, who is a professor of journalism at the University of Oregon, and who wrote an article about him in Journalism History, uh, shortly after we gave him the award <coughs> in Boston in 1980, which helped to bring Sells back to the national limelight. Uh, Dennis, uh, a former colleague of mine, also uh, points out that uh, Sells uh, has rejected in many ways the practices of journalism, but he has never, never rejected the idea of journalism. Also, that he is an angry man, but he is not bitter, and I think anyone seeing him talk uh, on this series will we'll see that that comes through. He's valuable to scholarship also because he does research, in a sense, by matching reporting with better reporting, often as a participant and as a, an observer of sorts, uh, combined. And this adds to our original knowledge about the world and about uh, history. Uh, and in our own field of communications, as, as you may know, we too often, I think, rely just upon analyses of content, that is, what is reported, and on survey research methods to, as major research tools to tell us about what's, what go, what's going on in the world. Um, also, he's an interpreter of history as well as historian. He's uh, somewhat of a living paraphrase of Mark Twain's uh, reminder of how much people know that isn't so, and perhaps uh, somewhat of a paraphrase of the rather brash remark attributed to Henry Ford that all history is bunk. Uh, or as Ennis Sells reminded me when I talked with him in Boston, that uh, he, Euripides, for example, said, let the facts uh, speak for themselves, and he uh, sells his very, has been very influenced by Montaigne's advice, quote, I speak the truth, not so much as I would, but as much as I dare, and I dare a little bit more as I grow older. And that gives us hope, because a lot of the people, including my colleagues who thought he was dead, those who knew even about him, uh, they are... Uh, we're not that happy that he's still alive, and I suspect that a lot of the people he's criticized in the press are not that pleased that he's still around. But uh, I, and certainly you, and a lot of other people don't share that hope. Uh, is there, there, there's one thing that strikes me very, very strongly, and that's the fact that this man is a cultured man. He knew what he was talking about. He was intimately familiar with the culture of the countries he was in. He knows five, at least five languages, always knew the language of the country he was in. And yet nowadays, do you see that? Well, frequently, the criticism of the press today does not have that kind of depth for a number of reasons, perhaps, and this brings to mind the fact that he had a, an entree and a direct contact with many incidents and many sources that perhaps today modern public relations and modern press agentry may inhibit. So he did have that special kind of privilege. and. Uh, one wonders uh, what he's going to expose in his, in his next book, or the book that will be next. Uh, it is an expose on public relations. And so perhaps uh, that has to be taken into account in contrasting him to some of the more modern critics. Uh, people like Dave Halberstam did this book, uh, The Powers That Be. Now, that became a bestseller. 
Uh, and many of Nader's investigations are done through a d direct type of observation investigation. Um, I don't know. It's, uh, Sells is a unique man who's lived at a unique time and had a unique kind of a passage, if you will, in some of these instances which he shared with us on film. I know on the networks, for instance, they refuse to let their reporters learn the language become acculturated mm -hmm. and actually become intimately involved and knowledgeable in the country that they're in situation that they're working in. When they are there very long, yeah. they jerk them out and bring a total stranger back then. This is policy, which is, and we can see, we can see how the reporting suffers from it. Well, uh, the, again, I think that uh, many of, he, let's face it, he's heading for a hundred and so that the practices of the media have changed. And uh, he, I think many of his, uh, Criticisms remain solid. Uh, the kinds of things he talked about uh, in the 30s, many of these things are still true. Do you think that? Do you, do you think that the blatant uh, censorship and distortion and lying uh, still goes on? That it's not as severe. As, I, I think that uh, when he talked about uh, press ethics in the 30s, they kind of poked fun at him. But uh, probably there has been a general improvement in pre press ethics in general. But uh, he is still. Uh, he was warning us, for example, in the 30s about uh, the dangers from cigarettes, uh, problems of alcohol, and so forth. Uh, and, and yet that is very timely today. He talked about internal threats from corporate uh, pressures as compared even to the outside uh, pressures from the government, and that's still relevant today. Uh, so perhaps uh, some of the newer critics are different in some ways, but in other ways, they're carrying on his tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see this tradition more intimately next week in our last section of uh, this three-part series on George Seldes because we'll, he'll tell us about his newsletter. In fact, he actually started a newsletter which had nationwide circulation, how it was destroyed by the McCarthy era, and he himself was hauled up before the McCarthy committee. He talks about the press distortions and covering uh, revolutions going on in Mexico, and once again, he, he talks about these things that the regular press ignored, like the cancer and cigarettes. And also the American concentration camps. They are with us and they are legal. And he exposed them first, and this is something that still isn't talked about in the regular media. So we have another f a full hour about George Seldes next week on Alternative Views. Good night.